by far my favorite part of flying is the takeoff. You go hurtling down the runway at over 100 miles an hour, suddenly your body is pressed into the seat as well over 100,000 pounds of steel and people and fuel, aluminum, is all being lifted up into the air. To me, that's just an incredible marvel of engineering. But that's not even why I'm making this video. The part that makes it most interesting is all of that mass has to land back on the ground at unbelievable speeds. Let's take the 737 for example. This thing has a takeoff weight of 170,000 pounds and it cruises at 40,000 feet. Now inside the cabin that feels amazing. The temperature is just fine. But outside the cabin the temperature is about minus 40 degrees. Whether you think in Celsius or Fahrenheit, that's cold. Eventually you're gonna come down from minus 40 degrees C. These six tires are gonna bear all the weight of this enormous plane and they're gonna accelerate to the landing speed, which is again, over 100 miles an hour, heating up these little tires to about 200 degrees Celsius. And they do this over and over and over again. To me, that is unbelievably impressive. Once I started exploring how these tires are able to do this, I realized there's way more to it than just some special rubber. There's a whole ecosystem of engineering going on, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Let's jump in by talking about the first most impressive thing, and that is how unbelievably small these tires are. At first glance, an airplane tire does indeed look like a road tire. I mean, it is still a rubber tube wrapped around the rim. But if you investigate just a few minutes further, you'll start to notice a lot of differences. The next time you're in the airport, take a moment to look out of the window and pay attention to the size of the tire relative to the size of the entire plane. Let's take one of the more popular models flying in the sky today. That's the Boeing 737. This plane has six tires and the tire diameter is about 27 inches. Now, if you haven't noticed already, this tire is tiny relative to the size of the plane. If you're like me, you probably haven't had very many opportunities to stand underneath an airplane. So I'm gonna take this tire, which is designed for a model airplane, and let's use this for a scale reference. As I mentioned before, the 737 has a tire height of about 27 inches, but a standard tractor trailer tire has a height of about 35 to 40 inches, depending upon the model of the truck. So when you compare the two, as you can see, these road tires are enormous compared to the plane tires. But if you compare the load differences between the two, that's where things really get impressive. The 737 has a maximum takeoff weight of 170,000 pounds. That's 170,000 pounds, slightly more than that, divided by six tires. A typical tractor trailer has 18 tires and a maximum DOT load of 80,000 pounds. So let's just assume that the weight's evenly distributed and we're driving at the maximum weight allowed by law, 80,000 pounds spread over 18 tires. That breaks down to about 4,400 pounds per tire. <laughs> and indeed, that's pretty impressive. But the 737 has six tires at 170,000 pounds. We're talking about nearly 29,000 pounds per tire. When you compare the difference in size relative to the capacity that each one has, the difference becomes really surprising. This little bitty tire can carry many times the load of this giant tire. So how is it we can pack so much more capacity in such a tiny package? Well, that's where the engineering gets interesting. So let's talk about that next. In order to understand all the differences, I need to explain why this tire is so different. I mean, this guy is much more expensive than this guy. So why not just scale this tire up and stick them on airplanes? When it comes to an airplane, the size and weight of each component matters a great deal. A tire made with this material and scaled up to fit the application would be really heavy. It would consume a lot of the interior space and cargo space is precious inside of an airplane. Not only do we wanna conserve cargo space, but we also want to conserve weight. Heavier tires means we spend more money on fuel and that is a no-go when it comes to flying an airplane. To make this tire smaller and increase its capacity, we're gonna to need to make a lot of changes. And since we're making changes anyway, there's some things that the road tire needs to be able to do that an airplane tire doesn't need to do and we can get rid of those features. Road tires need to be able to deliver all the power of the car directly to the surface of the road and it has to be able to do that under a really wide range of conditions. You drive in mud, you drive in snow, you might be on a gravel road, your tire slips off the highway and you want the driver to be able to maintain control of the vehicle delivering that power directly to whatever contact surface is there. Airplanes on the other hand have an entirely different situation. First, you're not delivering any power to the tires. These tires just roll along the ground. All of your forward thrust is coming from your jet engines or your propeller. The tires are simply there to cushion your landing, give you a rolling surface to transition from the air to the ground, and you wanna get maximum traction when you apply the braking force 
to slow your plane down. Of course, airplanes have to land in adverse conditions as well. Sometimes it's snowing or raining, but the environment is still very different. The airport is a straight line, a controlled space, with a whole army of people going out to make sure there are no potholes, no obstructions in the road, and clearing off the runway to ensure a safe landing. There's another example of vehicles moving along the ground at high speed under ideal conditions. Many years ago, I took my son to a drag racing event for his birthday. Thing on the uh, ramp. <laughs> Drag racers have a strip of land that has been well controlled. They make sure there are no potholes. They make sure that there are no obstructions. And you would notice that the drag racer tire looks much more similar to an airplane tire. It's a smooth pattern giving you maximum traction because you're riding on ideal conditions. With the exception of the fact that airplane tires have grooves in them. And that's because airplane tires need to be able to land when the runway is wet. These grooves allow the water to squish out around the tire, giving the rubber opportunity to make good solid contact with the runway. The next thing we need to design is a much stronger rubber. Airplane tires are designed with a special elastomer. This tire has been interwoven with nylon and reinforced. Even the weave pattern is designed to handle the special dynamic loads that occur when landing an airplane. This rubber is also designed to be electrically conductive. We normally think of rubber as being an insulator protecting us from electric buildup. But if you've ever dragged your feet along the carpet or rubbed a balloon on your hair, you know that there's a buildup of static electricity and this can be discharged suddenly. During takeoff and landing, there's a huge amount of friction between the rubber tires and the ground, potentially building up a static charge. And this can damage electrical equipment in the airplane. Making these tires conductive prevents these tires from building up such a static charge. This rubber is not just stronger than the road tires rubber, it's also significantly stiffer. The rubber is so stiff, in fact, it is impossible to stretch this tire over the rim. So the rim is actually made of two pieces and you disassemble the entire rim in order to put the tire on the rim. But even with the increased strength and stiffness of the rubber, you still have to bear an enormous amount of weight. So airplane tires are designed to withstand much higher pressures. So how does increasing the tire pressure allow you to carry more weight? Well, we've all experienced this. Whenever your tire runs out of air, you notice it rises closer and closer to the ground. That's because it's spreading out the weight of the car over a wider area. Well, if we take that the other direction and we increase the tire pressure inside of this tire, assuming the tire could handle it, this wheel would be able to bear more weight while maintaining its shape, its original shape. So if we want a smaller airplane tire to maintain its shape, we need a higher pressure inside. And that's why the tire is stiffer and stronger because this is still a balloon. If I was to over inflate this tire, it would swell and be out of shape in the other direction, looking more like a donut than a tire. Vehicles like this will have a tire pressure of about 30 PSI, and that's plenty to support the weight of this vehicle. A uh, tractor trailer from our example earlier will be more like 80 to 100 PSI, but airplanes like the 737 will have a tire pressure of 200 PSI. If you go to fighter jets where you want the tire to be even smaller, they might be more like 300 PSI. But in all of those cases, the tire has been designed to handle the higher pressures while maintaining its shape. Increasing the pressure to 200 PSI solves several problems for us. We're now able to carry a lot more weight with a much smaller, more compact tire. But this actually introduces a new problem. When you take room air and compress it to 200 PSI, we've squeezed a lot of air molecules and moisture molecules inside of this confined space. This is not a big deal for cars riding along on the road, but it's a huge problem for airplanes. So let's talk about that next. Hey, I just wanted to break in here and let you know that videos like this are made possible because of my patrons. These guys are a huge help in helping me fund this process, especially big projects like Jarvis. Patrons get to see new videos first. They're released there at least a day before they go live on YouTube. I get a lot of video suggestions there, and it's a good opportunity to have a slightly more private dialogue. If you want to participate in that conversation or just chip in a few bucks to support these videos, you can click on the link in the description. All right, let's jump back in the video. 
If you take off from an airport in Arizona where it's 38 degrees C or higher, that's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then you fly up to an altitude where it's minus 40 degrees C, you're going to see huge changes in your tire pressure. But you're also going to see changes in the water vapor that's inside the tire. Because the tire gets so hot during takeoff and landing, any moisture inside the air is going to expand into water vapor or steam, which is about 1600 times the volume of regular liquid water. But once you reach altitude at minus 40 degrees, you see that expanded vapor is now going to immediately turn back into tiny droplets significantly reducing your tire pressure. One of my favorite examples of this is an experiment I used to do with my kids and this is easy for you to copy at home. All you have to do is take an empty soda can put a few drops of water in it and then heat it up on the stove. In less than a minute, those few drops of water turn to steam and push all of the air out of the can. If you flip the can over and quickly chill off the can, the steam will shrink back down to just a few drops. There's nothing inside of the can pushing out and thus that can will collapse. Imagine that can as your airplane tire. This entire process has the reverse when the plane lands. Those few drops of water turn back into steam, expanding inside of the tire. If that tire was properly inflated when you left, it's overinflated now upon landing as you slam on the brakes, heating up all of those surfaces. But you don't just have heat coming from the rubber rubbing against the road. You've also got an enormous amount of heat coming off of the brake pads as they try to absorb all the kinetic energy of this massive airplane. That heat is also being dumped right into the surrounding tire, superheating that rubber and creating a potential risk for both rupture or even fire. Unfortunately, this is not one of those situations where we're talking about what ifs. This really happened. Back in 1986, Mexicana Flight 940, a Boeing 727 was flying along and eventually crashed into a mountain after it caught on fire. When they investigated the flight, they found that at least one of the tires had been filled with compressed air, and they believe the cause was a combination of the brakes failing, which heated up the tire to the point that it exploded, it ruptured fuel lines, and led to a series of issues eventually bringing the plane down. All 167 people on board were killed instantly. I will leave links in the description where you can read more about this crash as uh, different sources give slightly different versions of what they found. But the important take home message here is that the FAA considered the compressed air issue to be so important that they made a new mandate requiring that all commercial planes over a certain size must use nitrogen to, as their fill gas instead of compressed air. So why nitrogen? There are actually quite a few reasons why nitrogen is better for this application. Because nitrogen cylinders have very little to no moisture inside of them, we're gonna greatly reduce the amount of expansion and contraction we get compared to using compressed air. Also, because nitrogen is an inert gas, you're gonna have less reactivity with the rubber itself, and there's gonna be less decay of the steel and aluminum components inside of the tire. Because the risk of overheating and expanding the tire is so great in this application, Airplane tires have yet another feature that road tires don't have, and that is a fusible plug. Inside of the tire, there is a plug that will actually melt at a certain temperature, allowing the gases to slowly escape. You'd much rather have a tire slowly deflate, bumping down the runway, than to have a catastrophic rupture. Now at this point, some of you might be thinking, man, it sounds like some of those features ought to be implemented in road tires. For example, we could implement some of these features like higher pressures and stronger rubber to make the tire lighter and smaller. That means we'll get better gas mileage, right? It's this kind of question that makes engineering so fascinating to me because there's always a trade-off. For example, that tire is gonna be much more expensive than the regular road tire. And how many consumers want to have to pay two or three times or maybe even six times as much for their tire. Also keep in mind that road tires have to endure many more obstructions in the road. For example, driving over nails and sharp objects in the road. If you get a puncture with a 200 PSI tire, the potential danger is definitely higher than if you got a puncture with a 30 PSI tire. You also have to keep in mind that regular consumers all over the world need to be able to fill their own tires and they need access to these high pressure compressors in order to do that. There are actually two other side effects that come from this. Number one, having a larger tire actually leads to a smoother ride. And we'd all like for those long rides on the road to be comfortable. Airplanes are only riding on their tires for a couple of minutes at a time. And the other side effect is you increase the pressure that's on the road. Think about the difference between somebody pressing a block against your chest with 10 pounds and pressing a knife against your chest with 10 pounds. There's a huge difference in the result. And the same is true with highways. If we made the tires smaller, therefore increasing the pressure on the road, we also need to make the roads themselves stronger and more reinforced. And we've got many thousands of miles of highway out that need to be maintained. Runways are actually made 
of much stronger, thicker concrete than highways. I could go on and on about all the differences, but I think I wanna sum this up by saying engineering is this fascinating field where you're constantly struggling with these things that are at odds with each other. You know, how do you make it lighter? How do you make it cheaper? How do you make it stronger? And it's got to be safe, but it's also got to be affordable. And bringing those two things together can often create interesting challenges. If you like this video, there is more to come. I am working on a whole series about the engineering of airplanes. I have made many videos based on suggestions. So if you have an idea, please share it in the comments below. We're not talking about flight in this series. I'll leave that to the aerospace engineers. This is about all the interesting mechanisms that allow aerospace to do what it does. And I'd also like to take a technical look at some of the failures that have occurred and the things we learned from that. If you'd like to see more videos like this, you should hit the subscribe button and also click the little bell to get notifications so you'll see when the next video comes out. Thank you so much to my patrons, these fine folks you see scrolling on the screen here. These people are the ones who help make these kind of videos possible. Thanks for watching.